your monthly dose of astronomy news and views. This is Awesome Astronomy. Hello and welcome to episode 15 of Awesome Astronomy for September 2013. In a month when we've been, well, absolutely overwhelmed with astronomical events from Perseid meteors to a nova shining bright in the constellation Delphinus, we've got tons of news to bring you, your regular sky guide to show you what to look out for in September, Paul will be explaining how stars work in his 5 minute concept, and I'll talk about the upcoming solar maximum with the director of the Wilcox Solar Observatory at Stanford University. And to round off the show, we'll be answering your astronomy questions in the popular Q&A section. But before we jump into this month's show, here to keep order and fact-check some of our wilder speculations is the Dark Lord of Astronomy himself, Darth Paul. Hello there. Well, let's banish the light and jump straight into it. Paul, what have you been observing this month? Oh, it's been an amazing month. Um, I, I, we've, we've had whole weeks of, of clear skies. Mm. Uh, uh, it's been the meteors. Um, I spent a, a beautiful evening at the peak just laying on a, on a driveway on a blanket, just watching meteor after meteor. I think we, we got a, a rate of almost 60 an hour. Yeah, I was thinking that we'd got a, a particularly higher peak than normal this time around. So you think it was about right, around about what they were predicting at 60? I think so. We're certainly where I was. It was it was reaching up to about 60 an hour. But, I mean, there were some really cracking bright meteors. Mm, really good fireballs. Really good, really good. What else? There's been the Nova. Yeah, we've had a Nova in the sky. We, I'm going to be talking about that in more detail a bit later on. But, yeah. but that, that was exciting. That's a great little unexpected treat. I've been looking at planets, I've done Uranus and Neptune, I've been looking at globular clusters. As really always. taking advantage of these clusters. Oh, it? it's been fantastic. Whatever's been in front of me, I've been looking at it. It's been just a cracking summer. This is Awesome Astronomy. Okay, so that's last month's guys, and now that the Northern Hemisphere days are getting shorter and the nights are getting more comfortable to observe in, what have we got to look forward to in September skies, Paul? Yes, finally September is here, with sunset in Berlin, Toronto, London and New York around 8pm on the 1st of the month and around 6.30pm on the 30th. We're finally getting back to long dark nights, with the only downside being the need to dig out that coat and hatch you've forgotten about in the long balmy summer evenings. This month we start with the moon, which presents a couple of nice observation opportunities. The first to mention is a daytime occultation of the star Spica. Bright stars are visible during the day in a telescope, especially outside the brighter summer months, and in this case, using the moon, you should be able to locate Spica on September the 8th, when the dark side of the thin crescent of the three-day-old moon will pass in front of the star, at around about 1450 British summer time, 1350 universal time, and reappear from behind the sunlit crescent at about 1600 BST, 1500 UT. This is an excellent opportunity a star in the day, witness an occultation, and get a sense of the moon's passage through the sky. One word of warning, though, is in regard to the sun, which of course will be close by, so do not inadvertently swing your scope or binoculars in that direction. If at all possible, stand in the shadow of a building or a thick tree. The moon this month is also presenting a very favourable libration, which will give observers the chance to glimpse some far-side craters towards the end of the month, such as Hale on the 16th and Humboldt on the 20th. Also worth looking out for are Pythagoras and Pascal, which are truly monumental craters, Pythagoras measuring 80 miles across, with Pascal coming in at almost 70. We have new moon on the 5th, and we reach full moon on the 19th. Moving on to the planets, it is a good time to have a look at our most distant neighbours, Neptune and Uranus, which will both be high in the sky through September, and with Neptune having just passed opposition at the end of August, and Uranus approaching opposition in October, both planets are essentially as close as they will be all year. And with them in the neighbouring constellations of Aquarius and Pisces, respectively, they can easily be seen in a short observation session. With both planets, unless you are lucky enough to have a large aperture scope, there is not much to see except small blue-green planetary disks. But you will be able to see they are definitely not stars, and knowledge that you are looking at these distant worlds from your backyard is rewarding. Mars and Jupiter continue to improve in the early hours, with Jupiter and Gemini especially getting high before dawn, and presenting us with almost 40 arc seconds of disk by the end of the month. Mars still has a long way to go before it's a serious observation target, but in lieu of surface details and a wide disk, Mars will spend the first part of the month passing through Cancer, and will provide a fantastic imaging and observation opportunity as it passes through the open cluster M44 between the 7th and the 10th. The Beehive cluster M44 is stunning in its own right, but with the addition of this pink-red interloper it promises to be one of September's unmissable sights, though you will need to be an early riser to catch it, with Mars and the Beehive not rising above the horizon until after 3am at latitude 51 degrees. With sunrise at about 6.20am, you'll need to be quick. 
Venus is still not brilliantly placed this month, but it should be an easy visual target after sunset, blazing away at minus 4.1 magnitude. But caught up in the glow and haze of the evening, it's still not giving us much to look at. We start September with a phase of just over 70%, and this reduces towards 60% as we begin October. The Mercury is lost in the sun's glow this month, while Saturn is still just visible around sunset, but is a difficult object to look at, and is essentially lost to us until the winter. Moving on to the universe beyond the solar system, September presents us with an interesting transition period, with many of summer's attractions still in the sky but now in the west and not up all night, while in the east the parade of autumn and winter constellations is rising, and for the early risers looking east before dawn you will see Taurus and even Orion. Pegasus and Andromeda start to dominate the sky as the month goes on, and while galaxies M31, 32 and 110 are always worth a look, don't forget to look out for M33 in the nearby constellation of Triangulum. This galaxy is also part of our local group, and while a large target, it is notoriously hard to see. Moving back to Andromeda, do look out for one of my favourite planetary nebulas, NGC 7662, the Blue Snowball. Not an easy object to locate, being away from the main body of the constellation, but well worth the effort. Another object which is a good test of patience in Andromeda is Mirax Ghost, or Galaxy NGC 404. It's a galaxy about 10 million light years away, thought to be just beyond our own local group, and is a difficult object to observe or image because of its proximity to the star Mirac, which at second magnitude tends to overwhelm its dimmer neighbour, hence the name Mirac's Ghost. The real star of September has to be Cassiopeia, which is well placed in the sky and with the Milky Way running through it, this is a constellation packed with clusters including M52, 103 and NGC 663. While NGC 457 is one of the most amusing objects in the sky, nicknamed ET, Owl or the Bat Cluster, you decide. Of interest to those with bigger scopes are two more members of the local group of galaxies, the lesser known elliptical dwarfs NGC 185 and 147, which are gravitationally bound to M31. For the double star fans, remember to turn your scopes onto the brightest star of Cassiopeia, Shadir, while Eta and Iota Cassiopeiae are a double and triple respectively, while variable watchers are spoilt with Gamma, Delta and Rho Cassiopeiae, all being variables of different types. This Awesome well, this month we're absolutely stacked out with news, so we're not going to linger on any one item. So let's start with what else? Nova Delphini 2013. And this shows that amateur astronomers still have much to offer because a Japanese astronomer called Koichi Itagaki, if I've pronounced that right, spotted a star on the boundary of the constellations Delphinus and Sagittarius on the night of the 14th of August. Now, the star that's normally there is a very faint white dwarf star. And what we saw over the next few nights was the reignition of nuclear fusion on the surface of the white dwarf as it sucked hydrogen from an orbiting binary companion in a process that we call NOVA. And we know that these can last for many weeks as the last NOVA in Delphinus did in 1967 and they can calm down and then flare up again later as Euscorpii has done at least eight times that we know of in the past. And if it continues to accrete more hydrogen than can fuse precariously on the surface the whole star can explode in a Type 1a supernova, which will be a lovely sight in the unlikely event that it happens. But it's been great to observe with a naked eye in a dark sky area, with binoculars or through a scope, and you took the time to sketch this nice cosmic serendipity. Yes, it's a little few minutes finding it in a pair of binoculars, mm. um, and then sitting in a, a warm, balmy summer's evening sketching it. It was a, it was a great sight, um, and it's really bright. Um, it, it's a really stunning, pure light when you see it. Yeah, I I took the opportunity to image this, and it wasn't difficult to find on the sensor, as often dim objects can be. Mm. And that's because Mm. this wasn't a dim object, especially in in that rather barren constellation, really. There's just a lot of field stars, so this nova really did shine out really bright. And if you want to see Paul's sketch and my newfangled photographic image of Nova Delphini 2013, take a look on the Awesome Astronomy group on Facebook. And from the sublime to the ridiculous now, because the US government has acknowledged the existence of Area 51 under a Freedom of Information Act request. Now, for anyone who's been blissfully unaware of the conspiracy theories surrounding this military airfield, it's not really an astronomy story, but it does tie into the most tightly gripped fantasy of those who claim to know we've been visited by aliens with the technology to travel faster than the speed of light, to evade detection and transport humans away for anal probing, but somehow seem unskilled in safe landings or defending themselves against technologically backward apes. And the site, Area 51, was a secret base for testing experimental aircraft like the CIA's U-2 and Blackbird spy planes. But people with tinfoil hats abhor a vacuum, so this is where they believe the aliens and their spacecraft that didn't exist, but which crashed at Roswell, were taken. 
but they weren't because they were a figment of their imaginations that the Air Force were quite happy with because they deflected attention from the real spaceship that crashed, a high-altitude sensing balloon developed to detect Soviet bomb detonations. So what has been declassified? Well, we have a plan of the desert airfield 90 miles outside Las Vegas and it's used for you to spy plane tests and training, but no mention of aliens or extraterrestrial technology research. So, just like the Obama administration's recent admission that they have no knowledge or credible evidence of alien visitation, that's just what you'd expect them to say, isn't it? Well, absolutely. I'll, well, I mean, we're proof. Exactly. Surely. Okay, so next up we have a Kepler mission update, and while we were holding out hope that the engineering issues that have prevented the spacecraft from continuing its search for even more exoplanets might have been a temporary blip, it seems you were right, Paul, when you called this a couple of episodes ago. The mission is over. Oh, I hate to be right, it's but oh, so I knew it. Sad. I knew it was doomed. But as NASA do these days, they're putting out a call for new ideas to extend the life of this mission. It's unlikely that it'll be used for the same purpose of spotting faint transiting exoplanets, as the NASA engineers have spent the last few months racking their collective brains to get it up and running again, but the reaction wheel failures persist with no viable workaround and it can no longer point accurately without using up its valuable onboard fuel supplies. So we wait and see what innovative uses it gets put to and look forward to the science that this phoenix of a spacecraft may yet still deliver. And staying with NASA, we have a triple milestone celebration because NASA's Juno mission has reached its halfway point between Earth and its destination of Jupiter, where it'll go into a polar orbit around the gas giant to analyse its gravitational and magnetic fields in 2015. It should also reveal the internal composition of the King of Planets. And the second milestone is the Mars Science Laboratory's first anniversary on the surface of Mars, and it's hard to believe that in that year it travelled just one mile and only drilled two holes in the ground. But before it's even reached its main geological target of the base of Mount Sharp, it's already proved the viability of the sky crane method of getting heavy payloads onto planets and moons with thin atmospheres, tested and calibrated its panoply of scientific instruments, used drills and lasers to determine chemical compositions on Mars for the first time, and the biggie, it's already completed its key mission objective to determine if conditions favourable for life ever existed on Mars. If you were wondering, yes they did. Drinkable water flowed, and Mars, therefore, once had a thicker atmosphere. Awesome. It would have been lovely. Yeah, it still is lovely. And the final milestone is that according to a paper in the Astrophysical Journal Letters by Mark Swizdak, James Drake, and Merav Ofer from the University of Maryland and Boston University, Voyager 1 has left the solar system. And this has been a closely anticipated and hotly debated event for the past few years now, and late last year NASA announced a press conference that we were all sure would reveal that Voyager 1 had become Earth's first ever interstellar emissary. Instead, the NASA team declared an unanticipated region on the periphery of the solar system that they dubbed the Magnetic Highway. But this new research, based on a new model of the solar system by Swizdak and his colleagues, suggests that the boundary was crossed just over a year ago. Now, Voyager 1 stopped detecting solar particles at this time, and it's only seeing galactic protons and electrons. But because the magnetic field direction remained the same, project scientists suspected that Voyager 1 was still within the solar system, and still is. Now, what Swizdak et al. find in their model is that the interstellar magnetic field can permeate the outer reaches of the solar system, and that this magnetic highway region was therefore a miscategorization of what was actually evidence of the craft reaching interstellar space. And that's how the situation still stands today. If the new model is right, Voyager 1 is now travelling in the deeper Milky Way and has been since the 27th of July 2012. If they're wrong, this new chapter in mankind's exploration of deep, deep space just has a few more months or years to wait. But how cool must it be to crunch the maths and discover for yourself that they point towards mankind taking its first robotic steps outside the solar system? Is that seriously cool. Yeah, I mean, it just makes you want to do that kind of research, doesn't it? Oh, it does, it does. So let's finish the news with something just as uplifting and inspirational, this time from the European Southern Observatory. And we're going to turn to a recent image from ESO's Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, or ALMA, that shows close up an image of jets of material streaming away from a newborn star at up to 180 miles per second. And when these jets collide with surrounding gas that the stars were born from, they create beautiful nebulous structures known as Herbig Harrow objects, but because there's a lot of gas and dust in the vicinity of these objects, telescopes observing optical light can't see through it to what's happening on the other side. In millimetre and submillimetre wavelengths, however, where microwaves and infrared meet, this gas and dust becomes penetrable and lets us see, in this instance, the far side of this Herbig Harrow object and the superfast jet streaming out from the far side. 
But as with all these images we see from these state-of-the-art telescopes, they don't just make great posters and screensavers, they get poured over and worked on by scientists to reveal more about our universe and the dynamics that apply, in this case in very cold or distant regions of the universe. But what's really amazing about this image is that ALMA isn't even finished and this work was done with a limited number of dishes using a limited number of instruments. By the end of this year we hope to have the full complement of 50 12 meter dishes all working together 5000 meters up in the Chilean Atacama Desert to explore new stars and planets, early galaxies and galaxy formation. So even before its finished construction this new awesome array has allowed us to see regions in deep space with better resolution than previous instruments. It's allowed astronomers to measure the speed of these jets for the first time by viewing the carbon monoxide in the vicinity and the images will be better and faster when the facility is fully up and running later this year. Now Stuart Corder, the Elmer Commissioning Science Verification Project scientist, my old job, said of this work, the detail in the images is stunning. Perhaps more stunning is the fact that for these types of observations we really are still in the early days in the future, ALMA will provide even better images than this in a fraction of the time. So, more great science from the International Collaboration of Astronomers at the European Southern Observatory, with plenty more to come. This is Awesome Astronomy. OK, well here's the part of the show where Paul explains a complex concept in astronomy and puts you all in the picture. And this month he's talking the real foundries of the universe, the stars that make up all the heavy elements, and the process called nucleosynthesis. So Paul, take it away. Well actually it's perhaps one of the supreme achievements of science over the last century. Creating a working model of the interior of the sun, and perhaps more impressively distant stars, that predicts the reality we observe and fits within the laws of physics, is all the more impressive for the obvious fact that we can never l actually look inside a star to find out. Before the 20th century, any model of the Sun was doomed to failure, through both a lack of useful equipment and a lack of important discoveries and theories that were needed to complete a model of what makes a star shine. Back in the 18th century, there was no real conception of what the Sun might be like. The otherwise brilliant William Herschel suggested that the Sun had a cool surface under a brilliant hot atmosphere, and that this surface was inhabited by a race of locals, who would have massive heads to prevent them exploding in the conditions. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, even at the time, this was scoffed at, but general opinion until the 20th century was that the sun was producing heat and light in the form of chemical reactions. The sun was a fire, which given what was easily observable seems a reasonable hypothesis. Fire gives off heat and light, so does the sun. So how do we know this theory isn't correct? Well, let's take coal as an example. A British industrial age sun would surely burn the black gold. If the sun were a mass of burning coal, what does the science say would happen? Well, with a kilogram of coal typically providing 3.5 times 10 to the 7 joules of energy, and the sun weighing in at 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms, we can see there is an energy potential of around 7 times 10 to the 37 joules from coal. Sounds impressive, there are a lot of noughts in there. We know that the sun is blazing away at 4 times 10 to the 26 watts, as a watt is a joule per second. It's easy to work out how long our coal star would last. Well, if you divide 7 times 10 to the 37 joules by 4 times 10 to the 26 watts, you get 2 times 10 to the 11 seconds, or around 6,000 years. Now, even if we were young Earth creationists, which we're not, that's still not a long enough figure. Then there's the evidence of spectra. We can see the light from the sun and stars, and we can analyse the chemical signatures it contains. If, for instance, the sun were burning a fossil fuel, and of course the origin of all that fossil is going to take some explaining anyway, then the spectra would be dominated by carbon and oxygen, not, as we actually record, hydrogen and helium. It needed a new area of science to be uncovered before the hearts of stars would be understood, and of course, that was the science of the very small, the atom. Many famous names worked on the new science of atoms and particles, but it was one scientist and an astronomy hero of mine, Arthur Eddington, who first pieced together what was probably going on inside stars, namely the fusion of hydrogen atoms into helium inside the core of the star due to the immense pressure and temperatures, nucleosynthesis. At the start, his theory was rejected, and it took others such as the German-American Hans Bethe to take it further. So what is powering the stars in the sky? Well, it depends on the star, particularly its mass, but it boils down to a process that fuses hydrogen into helium, and in the process releases energy. In lower mass stars such as the Sun, the process is dominated by the PP chain. Now there are three versions of this proton-proton process, but our Sun is mostly thought to be powered by one known as PP1 or PPI. We begin with two atoms of hydrogen, which are of course single protons. They collide, 
one of the protons becomes a neutron, and a form of hydrogen known as deuterium is created. Some energy is released, as is a positron and a neutrino. Then our deuterium collides with another proton, a gamma ray, and some energy is released, and we now have an atom of two protons and a neutron, an isotope of helium, known as helium-3. Now our helium-3 needs to find a friend, and collide with another atom of the same. This sees the creation of helium-4, which is an atom of two protons and two neutrons. The release of energy and the liberation of two protons, hydrogen, back into the system to rejoin the fun. Did you follow that? Well, don't worry, it's essentially an atomic game of pressure cooker billiards. When billiard balls collide, there is energy release of sound and heat. But of course, it's a short energy as the balls don't fuse together or release gamma rays at any point. Though it may make the game more interesting if they did. But slowly over time, these fusions of atoms occur in the core of the sun, and core hydrogen is transformed into helium over a period of billions of years. In high mass stars, we see a different version of this atomic snooker known as the CNO cycle involving atoms of carbon, nitrogen and oxygen as catalysts in a process that still ultimately leads to the transformation of hydrogen into helium. Now what happens when the hydrogen runs out is where we move into the territory of the slow death of stars, something to be covered in a future episode. But suffice to say the sun is the size and shape it is because of the fine balance between the gravity trying to force it to contract and the radiation pressure from the core pushing outwards. When a star is in this stable balance we call it a main sequence star. When this balance ends, and for the sun that process is thought to be about a billion years away, then stars begin a whole new and more complex process that sees nuclear synthesis begin the creation of new, heavier elements, including the carbon that we burn as coal. And that brings it full circle. This is Awesome Astronomy. Well, while we're talking about nucleosynthesis, I went to go and speak to somebody who's dedicated his life to researching the sun. This month we have an interview with Dr. Todd Huxma, a solar physicist at Stanford University's Hansen Experimental Physics Laboratory. Todd's solar observatories group have been involved with some of the most advanced solar observing projects, including instruments for the space-based SOHO and Solar Dynamics Observatory. Todd spent four years working at NASA's headquarters, but is now back at Stanford as director of the Wilcox Solar Observatory. So Todd, thanks for joining us on Awesome Astronomy this month. Oh, it's my pleasure. Well, let's start off with a couple of simple questions that hopefully get us right into the subject. Simply, what is the sun and how is it here? (laughs) Well, the sun is a star and it's the one that gives us life and heat and everything else. And so it's the one that's the most important to us. But it's also an example (laughs) of what else is going on in the universe. Um, It formed, oh, probably about five billion years ago. And uh, we're sort of in the middle of its lifetime right now. And how did it come to to be there, sitting in the center of our solar system? Well, it's probably more of a question of how did we come to be orbiting around it. Mm -hmm. Um, It coalesced out of a ball of gas and uh, probably in a group of stars far from here. It was ejected from that and we've been traveling sort of on our own now for quite a while. And our planet uh, is one of the ones that formed around it. And as you know, there are eight or nine if you still like Pluto. (laughs) And uh, we're happily on this one. You know, people have been finding lots of planets around other stars now, and so we know we're not alone that anymore, but not any like Earth. And uh, There's a lot that we accurately know about the sun today. For instance, we know its mass, we know its age, and that it has about five and a half billion years to go until it exits the main sequence and expands into a red giant star. And how do we know these things? Well, a combination of ways. One of them is that we look at other stars that have different ages but are otherwise like the sun. And so we can tell what the sun is like compared to those, and we can see those stars at different ages and and have an idea of what's going to happen to them. Uh, We also have fairly sophisticated computer models for how suns work, how stars work. The physical processes are are relatively simple, although working out all the details becomes more and more complex the closer you look. But the basic uh, age and structure and and course of life for stars is pretty well known just by looking at stars far from here. And a lot of your research is concerned with the sun's interior. Um, How do solar astronomers go about probing the sun's interior, um, learning about its internal mechanisms and the dynamics that cause these visible sunspots, faculae and solar flares that we can observe? The probing of the sun's interior is one of the big innovations in the last 20 or 25 years. Uh, We've learned to use sound waves that bounce around inside the sun. We call it helioseismology. So just as an earthquake observer here on Earth uses waves that propagate from an earthquake source 
to where their detector is to learn about the inside of the Earth based on how long those waves take to get there and what the conditions are and how different waves go in different directions. It turns out you can do the same thing uh, using the interior of the sun. Waves are generated near the surface of the sun and then they get trapped in the interior. And by looking at the frequency of those waves, you, the sun actually resonates like a big bell. Mm -hmm. And by looking at waves that resonate in different parts of the sun, you can learn about the temperature, you can learn about how fast it's rotating, and you can learn about, well, other dynamic parameters, uh, the magnetic field a little bit too. And so what we're trying to do with helioseismology is put together a clear picture of what's happening. We can only see the very surface of the sun, the outer 100 kilometers or so, which is a very, very thin skin directly. So to look inside, you need some other technique, and that's why we use the seismology. And when did seismology become its own science in astronomy? What's the history of seismology with the sun? Well, the first observations were taken in the 1960s, but it was really the mid-1970s before people understood that these were resonant waves. And so as time went on, we've actually become a little bit more sophisticated. We can now not just look at these global resonant waves. We can also look at waves propagating from just one place to some other place on the sun, and we can use it to build a finer and finer picture. So what we do is we, we measure, for example, in this local seismology technique, we measure the vibrations at one point on the sun, and then we look at all of the points around it and see when those sound waves actually reach the other spots. And we can see the structure beneath sunspots. We can see waves that are originate in solar flares as they move around. And we can use that all to tell what kind of motions there are on the inside of the sun. So as amateur astronomers, when we're looking at sunspots and prominences, what are we actually seeing there? Sunspots are regions where the sun's magnetic field is highly concentrated, and they emerge from the inside of the sun through the dynamo process. Now, we have some inklings about the dynamo process, but it's not fully understood. In other words, we cannot predict when the next sunspot will emerge. Mm -hmm. um, but sunspots do emerge on a cycle of about 11 years. And so what we're seeing in a sunspot region or an active region is a combination of flux that emerges from the interior of the sun, Sunspots can be as large as a planet. Um, they can be you know, tens of thousands of miles across, mm -hmm. or they can be a little bit smaller. They almost always come in groups. Uh, there'll be some of them of one magnetic polarity, positive, and the other magnetic polarity, negative. Um, and then they will typically live for about a month and then dissipate. And what about these prominences that we can see on the, the limb of the sun? The prominences are places in the atmosphere where the magnetic field is suspending gas in the atmosphere of the sun. And so the magnetic fields in the sunspots kind of act like a large magnet. And I think probably all of us in school at some point have, have looked at what a magnet's magnetic field does. We played with iron filings, for example, those <laughs> little toys that we have when we're kids. Um, and what happens in the sun's atmosphere is that the material collects along those field lines. And what we're seeing really is, is the illumination of those field lines by the gas that's being ionized in those particular places. So it's another indicator of what the magnetic field of the sun looks like. So it's like a really beautiful way of illuminating magnetic fields using plasma rather than using iron filings like you would in the classroom. Exactly. And one of the interesting things that we do with the Solar Dynamics Observatory, our current satellite, is that we take photographs in ultraviolet light. And the ultraviolet light comes from regions of the sun's atmosphere that's very, very hot. In fact, we, by choosing the different colors of ultraviolet light, we can look at different temperatures. And so we can see the plasma that's at half a million degrees. We can see the plasma that it's a million degrees and, and several temperatures in between and outside that range. Mm -hmm. And, what, and those are the really beautiful pictures because you see uh, fantastic motions. You see constant uh, evolution of the magnetic field. And that's all happening because of what's happening on the surface. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned there about one of the space-based telescopes that you've been working on. What can you tell us about what we're able to learn from SDO and SOHO that are currently out there looking at the sun 24-7? Uh, well, we have three instruments, really. One of the instruments is measuring the total brightness of the sun in the ultraviolet. And it turns out that that's one of the most interesting things for understanding space weather and how the ionosphere and communications and other technological systems on the Earth are affected by the sun. And that's sort mm -hmm. of a full disk instrument. But the ones that I'm more involved with are telescopes. One of them is the helioseismic and magnetic imager. That's the one that does the seismology and also measures the magnetic field on the surface of the sun. 
and it takes a photograph of the sun in the magnetic field every 45 seconds and we actually measure the vector magnetic field which is not just how strong the magnetic field is but which direction it points mm -hmm. uh, every 12 minutes and we try to use that along with the seismology which is a measure of the how fast the sun is moving in and out at any given point to try and infer the interior there's a there's a third instrument uh, the atmospheric imaging assembly which is the one that takes pictures in the extreme ultraviolet light and that's the one that shows the beautiful pictures of what's happening above the surface uh, where the energy is being deposited where the solar flares are happening and where some of the uh, activity that affects us here on earth is probably the most easy to detect <laughs> I think in answer to every question that I've put to you so far, the word magnetism's um, come out. So apart from the outward explosive force of nuclear fusion in the sun's core and then the ever-present gravitational force that's contracting it into a ball, would it be right to say that magnetism is the cause of pretty much everything that we observe on the sun? I think that's a really good way to put it. You have these large forces that are relatively constant in time. The sun's gravity doesn't change very much and the sun's overall luminosity doesn't change. But the magnetic field is the part that causes the modulation. It's the thing that causes the changes. It's the, cause, the thing that causes the storms that we experience. And so just like on the Earth, you know, the atmosphere is pretty much the atmosphere all the time, but it's the weather mm -hmm. um, that we have to deal with from day to day that is kind of one of the things that drives us. And so trying to understand the sun's magnetic field is really key to understanding the variations and the variability uh, that we experience in our environment. So what is it that generates the sun's super energetic magnetic field? Sun's magnetic field is generated by a dynamo, which really just means that there's plasma, which is ionized gas, and it's being moved uh, in various directions. And the motion of that plasma generates a magnetic field. So it's, it's not terribly unlike a generator in a car where you just rotate wires through a magnetic field. The details are a little bit trickier. Uh, we see several sorts of typical motions in the sun. We see convection, which is like a large-scale well, it's not actually boiling, but it's a large-scale motion like boiling. So, if, for example, if you put a, a pot of water on the stove and you heat it, you see that the water starts to move. It, it goes from mm -hmm. the bottom to the top because it's hot at the bottom. It expands, goes to the top, cools off, then goes back down again. That's, that's convection, and that's going on on the sun at a couple different scales, a very small surface scale and a very large scale. It goes about a third of the way toward the interior of the sun. So that's convection. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we have something called differential rotation, which is really kind of curious. It's the sun's equator rotates about two days faster than the poles do. So the equator of the sun rotates every 27 days, and the poles of the sun rotate every 30 days or so. And so you have this large-scale twisting motion. Then in addition to that, you've got other things like meridional flow, which is just basically a north-south flow or a south-north flow, poleward flow from the equator. And by putting all those things together in a churning ball of plasma, you wind up with magnetic fields being generated in that dynamo process. Now, it sounds very chaotic, and in, in some sense it is a little bit, it is quite turbulent, but in fact, you can actually describe those processes, and there are models for why the sun has an 11-year cycle and why sunspots emerge at certain places on the sun toward mid-latitudes uh, that actually gives us some confidence that we do understand what those processes are like. Well, coming on to these cycles, you recently suggested that the solar maximum we were all expecting to happen around 2011 and that we've been eagerly anticipating ever since could well be imminent in the next few months, you said. Can you tell us why you'd think this? Well, typically, the sun has an 11-year cycle. All of the, the cycle is somewhat variable, and this cycle doesn't look quite like the last few. It looks more like a cycle that we had back in the year 1900. And it's a much longer cycle. Uh, the polar fields at the beginning of the cycle were much weaker, and we have not seen very much activity. The rise to maximum, which typically takes about two years, has been slower and more gradual. And the polar field reversal, which is something that we've been able to track very carefully now for about four or five cycles, um, and with uh, other methods, indirect methods even back farther, occurs at the time of solar maximum. So there's good reason to believe that this cycle is not going to get a whole lot bigger than it's already been. Mm -hmm. And so it's about between half and third of what the previous few cycles have been. So it's, it's definitely a small one for us. And what are your thoughts on the speculation that we could be headed for a long period of low solar activity with low peaks over the next few decades? It's certainly a possibility. Um, the sun does go through longer cycles, as we can tell by looking back in cosmic ray records, um, in ice cores, and in um, 
uh, tree rings and things. Mm -hmm. so we, we can tell that there actually have been long-term variations. There was a long period in the 1600s when very, very few sunspots were seen, called the Maunder Minimum. And so there are times when the sun is less active. It's hard to say at this point whether we're heading into one of those or not. It's certainly a possibility. We've come off a fairly long interval of, of rather high activity. So if you just believe in trends, <laughs> you know, we're, we're sort of due. Um, on the other hand, as I was saying before, cycle 24, the one that we're in now, looks a lot like cycle 14, which was about 100 years ago. And in between then and now, the cycles have been pretty active. So it's a little hard to tell. There, there are some interesting clues. Uh, one of the things that people have been looking at is the maximum strength of the magnetic field in sunspots. So someone goes out every month and measures the, the strongest field they can find on the sun in a sunspot. And that number has been declining for the last 10 years or so. It's interesting. We don't know if that's a fundamental process or not, but it's something that's sort of curious. If the sunspot fields get weaker and weaker, Eventually, they won't be dark anymore. There uh -huh. will still be activity, but we won't see it as dark spots. And so that maybe is one explanation for what happened during the Maunder Minimum. So presumably that's like being able to judge a peak in the cycle, that it's uh, it's really difficult until actually it's actually happened. You can't tell it's happened until after it's happened. You're right. You're, you're sort of kind of like watching the tide come in. When is, when is high tide? You can predict you know, from the moon when high tide is going to be and from the local conditions. But... And if you're just sitting there on the beach, it's a little hard to tell until after it's mm -hmm. started going out again. So we're sort of in that in that position right now. We have a marker. We know that it's you know it should be about high tide or it should be about the solar maximum, but uh, until it actually happens, you don't know. And there are times when you get big peaks. It, it could easily be that next year at this time we could be looking at several large sunspot groups and we could have another another peak. So what's still left to learn about the sun? What are the biggest questions still to be answered? Well, we'd like to understand better this whole concept of space weather, which is, you know, why are certain active regions bigger than others? How does the energy get stored in the atmosphere and how is it released in a way that affects us here on the Earth? Our technological systems are more vulnerable. Power distribution grids is one example. Uh, communications, GPS, uh, global positioning kinds of things. And we're becoming more and more reliant on them too. And we are, yeah. And so the real one of the real practical concerns is, you know, can we predict that well enough that we can take precautions? Because there are things you can do in each of those cases to either avoid the problem or, or ameliorate it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's one of the big questions. Uh, another question is, you know, why is the sun's atmosphere so hot? The surface of the sun is about 6,000 degrees. Uh, the atmosphere is, is in the millions of degrees. Mm -hmm. We know that energy is being deposited there, sort of like a microwave oven when you've got, you know energy trans going through the air but being deposited in the in the food that you're cooking but uh, how does that work on the sun we don't really understand that problem very well and then this whole idea of the dynamo you know what's happening inside the sun we have some clues as to what the solar cycle is and how it works but in terms of a predictive capability we don't really have that yet so there's some real mysteries there to unravel well finally if there was just one discovery in all of astronomy or astrophysics that you could make tomorrow what would it be well, I'm going to go outside my field just a little bit. I think mm -hmm. one of the big puzzles right now is what is dark energy and what is dark matter? Um, oh, you're going for both of them, are you? <laughs> well, sure. You know, I think they've <laughs> got to be related to each other somehow. You want to make sure on that Nobel Prize. Yeah, that's right. I want to get a double lock. But I, I think that's, you know, one of the big fundamental questions. Well, thanks very much for speaking with us this month on Awesome Astronomy. It's been an absolute pleasure learning about the sun. Dr. Todd Huxma, thanks very much. You're welcome. This is awesome Okay, it's time for Q&A, co-sponsored by Google and Wikipedia, where you get to ask us anything you want about space or astronomy. And we've got a couple of diverse questions lined up for you this month, but if you want to ask us any questions to read out on the show, you can by tweeting it to us at AwesomeAstroPod or posting it on the Awesome Astronomy Facebook group. But if you see any astronomy questions in a specific thread asking for them, please remember not to answer them yourself, because if you do, they won't get used here. So, let's get into it, shall we? You're starting with a question about our lovely moon. Yes, our first question comes from Grace Murphy in Glasgow via Twitter, and Grace asks, is there an atmosphere on the moon? And the simple answer is no, with the more complicated answer being yes. So let's start with the simple answer, the no answer. You remember the Apollo spacesuits that were needed to supply oxygen to the moonwalking astronauts and provide them with pressure against their bodies so their blood doesn't boil? Well, that's because there's no atmosphere on the moon to do these functions for them. 
But while in general terms this is very true, in actual terms there are trace amounts of gases being held to the moon by its not insignificant gravity. The moon's much smaller than the Earth and has one sixth its gravity, but even this reduced gravity has an attractive pull on the gases that are created in the lunar environment, either by the radioactive decay of elements already in the moon, or from the release of gases when meteorites or cosmic rays strip atoms apart. And what this amounts to is a cosmic tug of war battle between the gravity of the moon trying to hold on to the gases that it's released, and the solar wind that's trying to blow this tenuous atmosphere into space. The sun mostly wins out, but there is a gossamer veil of argon and helium in the main surrounding the moon, and that's a hundred trillionth as thick as the Earth's atmosphere that remains and is referred to as an exosphere. In fact, all planets and moons and some asteroids in the solar system that are regarded as atmosphereless all have a very fine exosphere. Awesome. And our second question relates to the first trilogy, and therefore the good trilogy, in the Star Wars saga, because Ian Thomas asks via the Facebook group, Here's my question for the next podcast. He couldn't do the Kessel Run, but exactly what feat could Han Solo have achieved in 18 parsecs, assuming this starting point was a lesser-known spaceport on Earth? Paul? What do you mean there's been another trilogy? Ah, the Kessel Run. The Luftwaffe's unsuccessful attempt to run an air bridge into the trapped Vermar and SS units of the Battle of Stalingrad. Turning point of the war, that, along with El Alamein and Midway. Is that right? I did not know that. And that, of course, is only the start of Lucas's problems in Star Wars, associating the heroics of Han Solo with an attempt by one brutal genocidal dictatorship to destroy another. Of course, there is the small matter of confusing parsecs as a measure of time rather than distance, which, of course, was deliberate irony and no so clever, apparently. <laughs> uh, well, let's stick with the science before I get lynched by a sixth former in a Sith costume. <laughs> OK, let's start with what a parsec is. Um, it may surprise you to know that astronomers don't really use light years. Um, in the vastness of the cosmos, they're just a bit small for a start. And then there's the problem of mathematically defining a distance and being able to actually measure it. So, what's actually used is the parsec, a word that comes from parallax and arc second. So, how is it defined? Well, it comes from attempts to measure the distances to stars using a method known as stellar parallax. The concept is simple, and is based on the idea that as the Earth orbits the Sun, its perspective view on the stars changes slightly, and it is very slight, um, and a nearby star will appear to change position with reference to stars further away behind it. As we know the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and because of the Earth's movements we can measure the angles to those stars as they appear to move, we can use some basic trigonometry that we all learned at school and we can work out the distance to the star. Okay, that's parallax. It's also worth pointing out there, Paul, that there's a nice simple experiment that's used, or a demonstration whereby if you look at a distant object like a tree Mm -hmm. or a light bulb or something, you, you point a finger at arm's length towards that light source. Ralph is now pointing his finger at a light source. If you close one eye then open it and close the other eye, you'll notice that your finger seems to move. And that's Mm. a a good demonstration that you can do with parallax on a a much smaller scale. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your your eyes are sort of representing the two positions of Earth, each side of the sun. Yeah. Um, And if you you keep your finger still or a pencil or something, yeah, that's demonstrating parallax. And equally, you could do the geometry, the trigonometry on that in the same way that you could on these these vaster scales. Yep. If, if you've got nothing else to do, you probably could. <laughs> okay, so as I said, that, that's parallax. Um, so now to get to the parsec, we need another concept lobbed into the mix. And that is the arc second. Um, as light years are too small, so degrees are too big. When you consider the moon is half a degree wide in the sky, then measuring astronomical angles and sizes with objects in a telescope it requires something a little bit smaller. So we have the arc minute, which is one sixtieth of a degree. Um, then we have the arc second, which is one sixtieth of an arc minute, so therefore one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. And if that wasn't enough, there's a milli arc second, which is one one thousandth of an arc second, and we have a micro arc second, which is a ten to the minus six arc seconds. But sticking with the arc second, we can combine this with the measurement of parallax to get ourselves a defined measurable distance, the parsec. Um, This is defined as the distance to a celestial body corresponding to a parallax of one arc second. So doing the trigonometry, you have a triangle with a base that is the distance from the Earth to the Sun, 1 AU, approximately 150 million kilometres. We have a right angle, and then we have the one arc second angle of parallax, which gives us a distance of 206,265 AU, or 3.09 times 10 to the 13 kilometres. So that's a parsec. So, Han Solo, he bragged about doing the Kessel Run, 
in less than 12 parsecs when it was originally an 18 parsec route. So he shaved over 1.85 times 10 to the 14 kilometers off the journey and must have utilized the curvature of space time. Now, I spoke to a tame Star Wars fan to find out if this is ever explained. Uh, and apparently, Solo and the Wookiee fly close to a black hole to cut the distance. I did point out that according to general relativity, this would probably take them longer as time would move a lot slower near a black hole, but I was in danger of being beaten with a plastic lightsaber in its original wrapping, so I left it there. <laughs> now, to finish off, if our intrepid general relativity defeating smuggler left Earth on an 18 parsec run, where would he get to? Well, 18 parsecs equates to 5.56 times 10 to the 14 kilometers, which would take you beyond the 15 parsec region of space that is typically talked about as being the sun's neighborhood. The best candidate for a destination I can find would be the star Delta Leonis, thought to be 17.7 parsecs. That's the star Zosma. Uh, that sits at the top rear of the line. Some might say it's bum, others Leo's hip. Um, it's an A-class main sequence star, twice the size of the sun, and possibly a member of the Ursa Major moving group. And I hope there is a cantina and no Imperial outpost nearby. Now, I'm sorry, Paul, I'm going to have to pull you up on an obvious inaccuracy there. You found a tame Star Wars fan. Well, he was washed. This is Awesome Astronomy. Well, sadly, that's all the time we've got for this month, but we do have some exciting developments on the horizon. Hopefully, before the release of the next Awesome Astronomy episode, we should have a new website with loads more astronomy, help, advice, and interesting content, and new ways for you to get involved too. So keep an eye out on www.awesomeastronomy.com. And also this month, from the 7th to the 10th of September, we have the pleasure of heading out to Uber Dark Skies in the Welsh Brecon Beacons for three nights of stargazing, filming for the BBC Sky at Night programme, astronomy talks, and we might even give away a couple of telescopes. And we know there's a few listeners to the show that are already coming along, and we look forward to meeting you and observing with you. Uh, if you want to join us, you still have till the 7th September to book at www.astrocamp.org.uk. Well, that's all from us, so until the 1st of October, when Paul takes over the reins again, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced by Ralph Wilkins and Paul Hill and is free to distribute for educational purposes. Music is courtesy of Star Soulsman. For more information about this podcast, visit our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com. You can join in the astronomy discussion on our Facebook group and you can follow us on Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod. We invite your questions to read out on the show. You can send them to us via Facebook, Twitter, or by email at awesomeastropod at gmail.com. We thank you very much for listening. From Cydonia Base, end of transmission. The moon's much smaller than the Earth and has one six. It's gravity. Six, 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 six. Ha, ha, ha.